The Spartan state in the late 9th century BCE was faced with numerous threats to its existence. Tensions were high with the Messenians to the west, and even the non-Dorian population of Laconia was now openly opposing the hegemony of the Lacedaemonians. Several battles were lost to the arch-rivals Argos, with even the Spartan king Dorysus losing his life to the Argive sword. Something had to change. It is at this time that the ancient records mention the name Lycargus, a figure that is credited with forever changing the Spartan way of life. While even the ancient writers are not in full agreement over many details of his life, modern scholars are equally unsure, noting that Lycargus may or may not have existed, and that he was likely not responsible for all the reforms that are attributed to him. Either way, in Sparta, he was viewed as somewhat of a founding father, more important than most of the actual Spartan kings. According to the poet Simonides, Lycargus was a younger brother of Eunomus, who towards the end of the 9th century BCE became the Europontid king in Sparta. His Aegean counterpart at the time was Agesilaus I. This was said to have been a time of general anxiety and lawlessness in Sparta. As Sparta was a diarchy, the two co-kings generally struggled to regain supreme authority ever since the royal power was relaxed during the previous generations. The situation was said to have been so bad that the previous king, Eunomuses and Lucargus's father, lost his life while trying to separate people engaged in a riot. Agesilaus I would pass away in 790 BCE and was succeeded by Archelaus. On the other hand, Eunomus himself was said to have died prematurely in about 775 BCE, leaving only his pregnant wife. It was then that Lucargus was declared king. However, upon learning that his sister-in-law was pregnant, Lycargus decided to turn down the kingship and announced that should the offspring be male, he shall be declared new king. It was said that during Lycargus' brief time of kingship that his sister-in-law approached him and even offered to commit abortion in exchange for marriage, which would keep Lycargus on the throne and make her the queen once again. Lycargus appeared to accept the offer, but insisted that the baby should still be born on the pretext of future queen's health. Meanwhile, he sent attendants to oversee the labor period, with instructions that if the baby was a girl, it would be left with the mother, but if it was a boy, it would be brought to him. According to Plutarch, when a male child was born, Lycargus' servants brought the little boy to him. He took it in his arms, as we are told, and said to those who were at the table with him, A king is born unto you, O men of Sparta. Then he laid it down in the royal seat and named it Carilaus, or the people's joy, because all present were filled with joy, admiring as they did his lofty spirit and his righteousness. Lycargus then assumed the title of Prodicus or Royal Guardian. As the result of this, his reputation was that of a just and righteous leader, highly popular among the Spartans. However, not everybody was sympathetic towards his growing power and popularity. A small group of noblemen, particularly those close to the Queen Mother, envied Lucargus and still held a grudge against him, believing that the former queen was treated with insolence during the whole process. On one occasion, her brother Leonidas actually confronted Lucargus and made it known that he knew very well that one day Lucargus will be king. The Queen Mother herself also started spreading similar rumors, promoting suspicion among the Spartans that should anything happen to Carilaus, it would be a result of Lucargus's treachery. 
Unwilling to put up with these intrigues, Lucargus decided to leave Sparta and travel abroad until the young king comes of age and begets his own son and successor. As he departed, Lucargus first landed on Crete, much of which was controlled by fellow Dorian city-states. The Cretans were known for developing some of the earliest legal codes in Greece, particularly the city of Gorton, famous for its legislature. It was there that Lucargus reportedly started studying the law codes and met many prominent people. Among those was Thales of Crete, a poet and a musician who was also credited with some of the early legislative work. Due to friendship with Lycargus, Thales traveled on a mission to Sparta where he worked on developing one of the systems of music, but also prepared the terrain for Lycargus to eventually implement his own laws. From Crete, Lycargus sailed to Asia Minor. His objective there was to observe and study the government of the Ionians, who generally practiced different lifestyle to that of the Dorians. Lycargus found that in comparison to the Cretans and his fellow Spartans, whose life was rather simple, severe and disciplined, the Ionians were extravagant and luxurious. He also got to study Homer's epics, which were at the time preserved among the posterity of poet Creophilus of Samos. During early 8th century BCE, Homer's works were still in possession of only a select few and were yet to be spread across all of Greece. Lycargus reportedly complied to the copies that he would bring back with him to Peloponnese. In the meantime, Sparta was at crisis. The authority of the kings was so severely undermined that they exercised virtually no authority over their subjects and fears were growing that Sparta would ascend into anarchy. The kings had sent for Lycargus numerous times, hoping that his presence and reputation would help restore order at home. Lycargus finally accepted to return and set sail to the mainland determined to implement laws that would revolutionize Sparta. According to Plutarch, Lycargus was convinced that a partial change of the laws would be of no avail whatsoever, but that he must proceed as a physician would with a patient who was debilitated and full of all sorts of diseases. Lycargus first went to Delphi, where he made a sacrifice to God Apollo and got Oracle's approval for the implementation of his laws. He then returned to Lacedaemon, where he was welcomed by the leading Spartans. Lycargus first revealed his legislative designs to his closest friends and then gradually included a great number of Spartan chieftains. One of the leading figures that most closely cooperated with Lycargus was named Arthmiadas. When the time came, Lycargus ordered 30 of his chief men to at dawn get armed and occupy the Spartan Agora. This move stuck fear into whatever was left of Lycargus' opposition and it became clear that there would be no resistance. King Archelaus, representing the Agiot dynasty, approved of Lycargus' actions and soon joined the agitators. However, among those afraid for their lives was none other than the young Europontid king Carilaos, who thinking that the whole thing was a conspiracy against him, fled for a refuge at the temple of Athena. The revolutionaries, on the other hand, had no intention of conspiring against the king and soon went to Carilaos in order to convince him of the real plans. After they all took the oath guaranteeing his safety, Carilaos ultimately left his place of refuge and joined Lycargus' cause. Everything was now ready for Lycargus to proclaim the so-called Great Retra, a set of legislative reforms that would establish the Spartan constitution and change the Spartan society forever. The very first thing announced by Lycargus was the formation of Gerousia, or the Council of Elders. The council consisted of 30 members, all of which held their positions for life. 
28 of those members were the Spartan aristocrats over the age of 60, called the Gerontes. The remaining two seats were reserved for the two Spartan kings regardless of their age, one representing the Aegead and another representing the Europontid dynasty. The Gerousia was the most powerful institution with extensive judicial and legislative powers. It served as the supreme court, where even the kings could be tried and punished if they broke the law. The Gerousia members decided on which motions would be presented for vote to the citizens' assembly, which was called the Ecclesia. The Ecclesia was available for all Spartan citizens, but its powers, however, were very limited in comparison to Gerousia. Citizens in the assembly could only vote with yes or no for the motions presented to them, with Gerousia even assuming veto powers over the assembly in the following century. Some writers also credit Lycargus with the institution of Epirate. Ephors were the five magistrates annually elected by the assembly among the citizens between 30 and 60 years of age. They provided balance to the power of the kings and basically ran the state affairs, both internally and in foreign policy. Ephors represented the highest office in the state, but served only a one-year term and could not be re-elected. Although writers such as Herodotus, Plato and Xenophon attribute the Ephorate to Lycargus, others such as Aristotle and Plutarch maintained that the office was created later during the Mycenaean Wars. Spartan citizens, also known as the Spartiates or Spartan Homoioi, were all made equal through the implementation of the new land reform. Up until that point, the majority of land in Sparta was owned by few aristocratic families. The new law compelled them to renounce their ownerships so that the land would be equally distributed among all the Spartiates. Land within the city limits of Sparta was thus divided into 9,000 equal shares which were to be evenly distributed among the citizens, as well as additional 30,000 shares throughout the Spartan territories in Laconia. The Spartiates were not permitted to have jobs, instead focusing on military. From young age, they were trained for battle and went through several phases of a rigid training and education program called the Agoge. This was designed to make the Spartan army the most disciplined and fear in all of Greece. Below the Spartiates were a class of second-tier citizens, called the Periokoi. Literally meaning the dwellers around, they were the inhabitants of various Spartan dependencies and towns that were not included in the citizen land division. The Perioikoi did not have a say in Spartan politics, but did have rights within their own towns and settlements. They were allowed to own land within their towns and to have jobs and conduct commerce on the Spartan territory. Just like the Spartiates, the Perioikoi also served in military and were often used as support units on the campaigns, but also fought shoulder to shoulder with the elite Spartans. The least privileged class were the Helots. They were the population that was captured and enslaved in Sparta's wars. They were attached to the land and not to individual owners, so that all the slaves were the property of the Spartan state itself. Lycargus banned the circulation and possession of gold, silver and other precious metals as means of currency. Instead, he introduced iron bars which were quenched in a vinegar bath after being raised to red heat, rendering them useless for anything else but internal trade. This was done to isolate the Spartan citizens from external trade and solely focus on making Sparta self-sufficient. To further promote the idea of equality, Lycargus introduced the institution of Sicitia, the practice that required all Spartan men to eat together in common mess halls. The Spartan women also engaged in physical activity since the young age, especially in sports such as running and wrestling. This was done so that the women were also physically fit and able to produce strong and healthy children. 
Unlike most of Greece, Spartan women could legally own and inherit property and generally had much more freedom and legal rights than in any other Greek city-state. Lycargus is believed to have died sometime in the 8th century BCE. The legend has it that after being satisfied with the legislature he implemented, he decided to go to Delphi once again and make another sacrifice to Apollo. Before he departed, he called all the Spartans, including the assembly, the Gerousia and the two kings, and had them take an oath binding them to observe his laws until he returned. Upon leaving for Delphi, Lycargus never returned to Sparta again, thus forcing the Spartans to abide by the oath and keep his laws indefinitely. Whether or not this story was true, Lycargus remained a figure of great renown among the Spartans, enjoying a hero cult in Lacedaemon long after his death. What he had left behind was a reformed Sparta, disciplined and militant, and more than ready to leave its big mark across the pages of history. We're introducing the Super Thanks. The Super Thanks button allows you, the viewers, to show an extra gratitude to the channel and get your comments highlighted and noticed not only by myself, but other viewers as well. Underneath the video, you will see a heart with a dollar sign in it. You can enter any amount that you find suitable. Hopefully you enjoy the content. Special thanks to History with Sai, Nico, Chris Ernst, Panayotis Yanopoulos, Fred Lecky, Tim Lane, ABC Shake, Derek Wildstar, Padre91, Argiris Margaritis, Well Sally Briggs, Labelle Olmier, Murray Cantane, Luis Aldames, Winner Illumination and Estate Care for their continuous support. This was 1XTV and we'll see you again soon.